Good morning to our participants joining from Europe and good afternoon to our participants joining uh, uh, online from China. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on exporting food and beverage uh, products to China, the challenges and opportunities. Uh, my name is Liam Jia. I'm the team lead of the EU SME Center. Um, today's session, uh, we are joined and co-organized together with the three of our partners, uh, with AICE, the Italian Association of Foreign Trade, uh, with China IP SME Help Desk, uh, and also with uh, the consortium partner of the SME Center, the Italian China Council Foundation. Um, to start with, I would like to very quickly give you an overview of uh, the EU SME Center. Okay, first of all, our agenda for today. Um, after the opening words, uh, we will uh, uh, cut to the chase and come directly to the first parts of the uh, presentation, um, I will, uh, which I will uh, present to you uh, very briefly on the ways to enter the Chinese food and beverage markets, uh, to give you an analysis of the different channels uh, and methods. Um, later, I will be joined by my colleague, Mr. Arvid Tilna, uh, who is going to present more from the technical a regulatory uh, perspective, uh, the technical regulations, certifications, and labeling, and eventually how to ensure uh, compliance when exporting your food and beverage products uh, to China. And last but not least, we were also joined uh, by Mr. Elio de Turio, uh, IP expert at China IP SME Help Desk, um, to uh, give us an overview on how to protect your intellectual property rights uh, when exporting your uh, products to China. Uh, at the end, we we'll also have a short interaction session uh, where uh, uh, our participants, where you can uh, um, follow your questions uh, directly to uh, all the speakers. Uh, please also take advantage of uh, today's session being online, a webinar session. So during the session, if you have questions, uh, you can also directly type in uh, in the question and answer um, uh, box uh, on the top of uh, the screen. Um, very quickly about the EU SME Center. We are a project founded by the European Commission. Um, our goal is to uh, provide support to small and medium-sized enterprises in Europe um, on getting them ready to do business in China. We do this uh, through providing first-line advices to inform uh, advise, uh, train, and eventually connect uh, SMEs uh, to market information, market access uh, regulations, uh, and eventually also to co conformity and standards uh, related uh, issues. Uh, the project has been founded already in 2010, and now we are in the fourth phase uh, of the project. Um, the services we provide include a self-diagnosis tool where uh, as a SME, you can do self-assessment uh, through a number of questionnaires. Uh, we do also have a very specific questionnaire on the FMB uh, sector. Um, if you are not aware of such tool, I highly recommend you to go to the website of the SME uh, Center, which you can see the link uh, from the top, from the bottom right uh, of this slide, uh, and to get uh, a very quick self-assessment uh, uh, on your readiness towards China. We have a knowledge center where over the years, over 200 uh, publications uh, being market studies, uh, being export guidelines and case studies uh, have been published. Um, all of these uh, uh, reports are also available on a free charge basis uh, to uh, European SMEs uh, all on our website. Um, we also provide inquiry services. Uh, our experts uh, in-house and external experts um, uh, can take all sort of uh, uh, China-related uh, business questions uh, you might have. Um, we also provide uh, trainings, uh, both uh, uh, offline face-to-face -face trainings as well as on online webinars. And last but not least, um, being on the ground uh, in China, we also constantly voice on behalf of European SMEs uh, uh, to the Chinese uh, policymakers to constantly improve the business environment for uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, European uh, ones uh, operating uh, on China. Um, going back quickly, uh, I will stop here uh, for the opening uh, and I also uh, pass on the floor now to um, 
Mr. Giorgio Gala from AICE to also uh, introduce a little bit uh, to us about uh, AICE. Yes, thank you, Liam. And thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar. Uh, my name is Giorgio Gala. I'm a business development manager for AICE. And now I'm going to say only a few words in order to, to bring you David Doniotti's greetings, who unfortunately can't be here today, and to introduce uh, our activities. We, as the Italian Association for Foreign Trade, are very interested in the argument, and we do often support uh, company, Italian companies that are interested in the possibility to exploit Chinese market potential. Our mission is to, to create culture for internationalization. And for that reason, we offer to our members uh, that are looking for a development of, of their activities uh, internationally, an extended variety of services, uh, both in technical, commercial, uh, or uh, uh, educational aspects. In doing this, uh, we take advantage uh, from the long time settled collaboration with the US Me Center, trying to give support uh, to Italian companies willing to sell their products in China. In order to offer to Italian companies uh, the possibility to access Chinese market, uh, we are now organizing in collaboration with the Italy-China Council Foundation, the participation of an Italian delegation to the China International Import Expo, that is one of the most uh, important fair in China. Indeed, by the way, uh, tomorrow on Friday 21, uh, we are going to host here in Milan in Conf Commercio, uh, an important event arranged by the ICCF to present to Italian companies the opportunities offered by the sixth edition of the China International Import Export that will be held in uh, Shanghai from 5 to 10 November next. The event that, uh, that will see the presence of a delegation of the Chinese Ministry of Commerce will provide uh, an opportunity to, to obtain uh, an update uh, on the economic situation of Chinese market and uh, also practical information for the participation of the fairs in 2023. Now, I would not to steal uh, more time to speakers' argument that are very, very interesting. And for that reason, I thank you all again and, uh, and I leave the stage uh, to Liam. Thank you. Thank you, Giorgio. Uh, indeed, uh, the China International Import and uh, Export Fair, uh, CIE, is one of the major fairs, especially also for um, food and beverage uh, producers. Um, I will quickly mention that also in my presentation when it comes to participation to trade fairs in China, uh, which again is a very traditional uh, approach, but still uh, stay as one of the best ways to test if your product uh, is uh, has a market uh, in China. Um, I will continue then with uh, the presentation. Please uh, quickly confirm if you can see my screen. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, as uh, I've already introduced in the uh, agenda quickly, um, yeah, I'm the team lead of the USME Center. I also have uh, uh, been uh, in a very small team. Uh, another role, uh, which uh, I will also be your uh, presenter, one of the speakers uh, today for today's session, um, joined by, of course, as I introduced to other speakers, has different perspectives. My perspective, um, as the first speaker, I will try to give you an overview of uh, where we are uh, when it comes to uh, food and beverage uh, exports to China. Uh, the different ways to enter the market uh, and eventually uh, also a bit uh, about wh um, what's happening when you are uh, here on the market. Um, to start with, uh, on this slide, I quickly uh, present to you, um, let's say, the evolution of China's food and beverage uh, imports. <clears throat> um, import, of course, being from China's perspective, uh, when China is importing um, food and beverage products from Europe. Um, the first stage uh, would be uh, when the first time that European uh, food and beverage products are available on the markets. And of course, this is the time when the producers, the manufacturers go to 
uh, a few uh, importers and which back then there were only very few of them and they uh, are mainly staying in large cities, uh, Beijing, uh, Shanghai, and then cities in the South. Um, and also this um, limited uh, number of products uh, that only serve a very small market. Going on <clears throat> um, in tier one cities, so Beijing, again, uh, this uh, uh, tier one cities in China, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, uh, Shenzhen start to, to have more uh, distributors uh, who are from these cities that are also selling uh, to smaller cities around uh, these cities. And uh, from the exporters point of view, there are also uh, starting to be more uh, of them uh, available uh, and started to export uh, to China. Uh, and this we were still talking about uh, before the Olympics, probably around that time. And then um, about a decade ago, the market started to grow very fast. And we start to see that tier two cities are um, representing the majority of the sales in terms of quantities. Um, and this is also the time when tier one cities uh, start to be more saturated. Um, and also around the same time, um, the e-commerce boom uh, starts to take place all over the country. And this is also the time when uh, retail declines uh, when it comes to uh, imported food and beverage products. So the FMB market in China, it's of course, first of all, a very complex one. Um, and it's still very fast growing. It has been a fast, a fast growing market. So being a fast growing market, of course, there is in, in need for foreign food and, and of course, naturally opportunities will uh, appear. But the question is, as a uh, F&B manufacturer or producer in Europe, how to take, how to be the one that take advantage of these opportunities? Um, and I can already tell you, it will not be easy and it will definitely not be a fast or just a one-time effort. Um, a few questions as, as an uh, uh, F&B producer in Europe um, that you might ask yourself, uh, where do I still see the growth on this market? Um, my products, uh, uh, which channels are the most suitable ones for uh, exporting my, my products? And China being, first of all, a large market, but also second of all, a very large um, country when it comes to the, the size of area, uh, which are the regions that I should primarily target uh, when I start my exports? Uh, and how do I position my products? Uh, who are the targeted uh, consumers uh, for uh, my products? If uh, an example would be I'm exporting a very high-end uh, olive oil, probably 99% uh, of the Chinese people are not your targets. Um, and uh, again, when it comes to uh, ways to start the export, uh, do I uh, go for traditional channels, uh, traditional uh, trade, or uh, cross-border e-commerce? Uh, and do I go to the first and second tier cities? Or I try to find opportunities in smaller scale cities, uh, which might have uh, less competition of uh, my own products? Um, and where do I find the distributors? Um, do I find a very well established distributors who are also dealing with um, same similar products, but from uh, possibly some of uh, uh, my competitors, or do I go to a, a, um, a, a less well-known distributor, but uh, represents potentials? And eventually, um, um, what do I expect from uh, exporting to a market uh, in China? Uh, is there still margin? Uh, do I aim for large volume of exports? Or uh, I, I go to I, I I target more on the on the price margin. So again, these are all questions uh, that you might um, ask yourself uh, when considering exporting to China. Um, with my presentation, I will um, again start with uh, ways to enter the market. Uh, as I uh, quickly mentioned just now, um, there are two ways to enter uh, the the Chinese market so through general trade and also through cross border e-commerce. Um, for exporters, uh, each way has its own pros and cons um, and also requires different levels of resources, commitment, uh, and time. Um, 
one thing to keep in mind is that um, selling via cross-border e-commerce um, does not exclude you from uh, being able to sell at the same time through general trade. Um, but the other way around normally is, is not the case. Um, to go more into details, uh, as an EU exporter of F&B products, uh, traditionally through general trade, so uh, ship your products uh, through containers. Um, um, this is what we mean by general trade, uh, the most traditional way of exporting your products. So uh, you will need to go through direct import uh, through international logistics um, and your products arrived at the China customs. Uh, uh, once you are cleared at the uh, customs, uh, your products will arrive at the hand of your distributor, uh, retailers, sales agent, etc. Um, or you might also have a um, sales office that you establish in China yourself. Um, after which, uh, the products will go to offline sales channels. Uh, or uh, when your products are already uh, here in China in the warehouses, you might also consider uh, traditional e-commerce before eventually your products arrive at the hands of uh, the Chinese consumer. The other way of selling will be through cross-border e-commerce, uh, where um, the Chinese consumers uh, will have the chance to directly place the order online. Um, and uh, selling via cross-border e-commerce, of course, um, it can uh, be also done through a, a bonded warehouse, through bonded uh, imports, uh, through uh, international logistics, um, but also um, available via direct import through international logistics after each order being placed. Um, again, the products will have to arrive at um, the customs uh, for clearance uh, before um, being uh, shipped to the Chinese consumers uh, through domestic logistics uh, in China. So these are the two different uh, main ways how um, products of uh, food and beverage can be exported. Um, so a um, bit more in details, uh, through general trade, uh, export can be done by working with uh, Chinese distributors, uh, buyers, agents, uh, retailers, etc. Uh, or uh, through a team, a sales team of your own. Um, and the sales can be done both online and offline. Uh, as mentioned, once uh, your products are uh, here uh, in China, in your warehouses, you could also consider uh, setting up uh, e-commerce platforms uh, within the country. Um, the advantage is uh, there's no limitation on uh, quantity. Uh, you can fill in as many containers as you wish, um, and the products are stored uh, basically in any warehouse um, that that's you uh, pay for in China. Uh, and all sales channels uh, are available. Uh, you could as well pursue uh, online to offline uh, strategies. The disadvantage would be that uh, it is a lengthy process uh, before having your products uh, arrive on a shelf. Uh, in, in the Chinese market uh, place, um, it's, uh, it's taking normally uh, some time. Um, and the collection of registration, testing, certification dossier materials um, and uh, will all take time. And eventually there's also a large uh, upfront investment um, as exporter you would put down. And for general trade, uh, keep in mind that uh, certain products um, might not be possible um, for exports of a certain type of uh, products when it comes to the food and beverage sector. Um, a protocol must uh, have been signed between um, your hosting country or where uh, you are based, uh, uh, where you register your uh, company uh, in Europe and, and with China. Um, if there is no such protocol, that means your product is um, not uh, available for being uh, uh, exported through uh, general trade. Um, so no ex uh, no protocol means no export. Um, currently, uh, there's also um, other situations where there is a temporary ban uh, of uh, imports uh, following uh, 
uh, disease outbreaks, for example, um, as I put in the in the brackets, uh, uh, Italian pork, uh, pork from Germany, and some uh, beef products. So this is uh, a bit about general trade uh, when it comes to cross-border e-commerce. Um, of course, the sales uh, are allowed. Sales are allowed only via these cross-border e-commerce uh, platforms. Uh, the very famous ones being uh, Timo Global from Alibaba um, and JD Worldwide, JD International. Um, and your uh, products can only be sold uh, by cross border e-commerce if the product is listed on the cross border e-commerce positive uh, list. Um, this list, uh, I will come to that part uh, later. Um, currently, there are 1,476 items on this list. Um, out of which uh, the majority are uh, food and beverage products, um, which you which also reflects the fact that cross border e-commerce uh, is a way of being used very often by um, F and B producers and manufacturers. Uh, the two different import models would be um, first of all direct shipping from Europe uh, once the order is being uh, placed. Uh, and the goods or through goods that are stored uh, in the bonnet warehouse in China uh, before the order is placed. The advantage is that there is less paperwork required, um, cheaper at cost, uh, lower at import taxes, um, and is also a good way uh, to engage directly on the consumer level um, to get initial feedback directly from um, the consumers who place the order for your products. Um, and there's also the, uh, for some products um, uh, that are without a protocol in place for being sold, uh, being exported by a traditional uh, by general trade, this is the only possible way uh, for you then to be able to sell your products uh, to China. This advantage, of course, is, is that uh, there is a positive list, meaning that you have to be on the list uh, to be able to uh, be eligible uh, for being sold via cross-border e-commerce, uh, and only specific, um, there's only sp uh, uh, specific uh, cross-border e-commerce platforms that are available um, for you. So no offline channels. Um, the delivery uh, can take a long time, um, and again, uh, you will need to uh, invest uh, also on uh, marketing of your products, uh, education of consumers. As normally, uh, if you're selling only via cross-border e-commerce, uh, you are uh, uh, missing the support from your distributor uh, agents uh, or sales uh, representatives uh, uh, in China, who are most of the time uh, doing the marketing for you. Um, again, today we have limited uh, time to talk about a um very could be very uh, broad uh, topic um so i'm not going into details on um many of uh, these uh, points but uh, the us me center we have uh, recently uh, actually it was in last month uh, published a comprehensive uh, market study um on selling to china via cross border uh, e-commerce uh, provides you with a comprehensive uh, understanding on the processes the cost uh, it also includes uh, some suggestions, recommendations on digital marketing. Uh, there's also four case studies uh, that uh, are from uh, European SMEs that we included in this report. And there's also an English translation uh, available of the positive list, uh, which has just been mentioned. Um, the report is free of charge, again, uh, for all European uh, SMEs. Uh, all you need to do is to go to the website and and uh, downloads this report yourself for further studies. Um, so when entering, uh, we just talk about two ways of uh, entering the Chinese market. When entering the food and beverage sector in China, what are the main uh, channels? Um, yeah, I'm going to just quickly put everything um, on slides uh, so as we can also compare. Um, on this slide, uh, on the on the left, you will be able to see the main um, channels uh, where the products uh, can uh, are being sold in China uh, through supermarkets. Uh, this we are talking about uh, international supermarkets or hypermarkets, 
um, like Walmart, Scaffo, um, the feature imported FMB products, um, as well as domestic ones uh, like the very local um, supermarkets that um, that everybody goes to on on a daily or weekly basis. Um, this uh, market, uh, this channel, can of course be considered uh, relevant. <clears throat> Um, in China, uh, for the various products are also being sold uh, via uh, specialty stores, so specialized stores. And these, uh, we're talking about some uh, boutique shops that sells uh, high-end wine, liquors, um, and, or supermarkets that are specialized on imported uh, F&B products. Uh, for example, just to name a few, uh, me, myself, I'm based in Beijing, in Beijing, uh, we have the Jenny Luce, uh, Apro Um, And if you're in Guangzhou, uh, you have the Corners Deli. Um, this channel can be considered uh, as highly relevant uh, as it has a very specific uh, focus on the type of products and also um, uh, the end customer. Um, in China, food and beverage, imported food and beverage products are also being sold uh, via convenience stores. Um, and these are, um, as you can tell from the name, is convenient. So from a consumer point of view, these are normally um, a place to go for a very small basket, uh, basket size. Uh, you, you go there for one or two um, very specific products you need um, at the moment. Um, and then you, you buy that uh, and that's it. Uh, so your consumer, your consumption behavior can be very easily described um, when purchases are being done uh, in the convenience stores. And uh, uh, again, yeah, most of these products are uh, either ready to eat, uh, of course, prepackaged products, but uh, ready to eat uh, food products and normally at a um, low retail price. Uh, some of the examples I can give here are uh, the Japanese brands, uh, the Japanese chain convenience stores like the 7-Elevens, Lawson's, um, and also uh, a few in uh, in other cities. Um, the relevance of uh, having your products placed on a shelf uh, in a convenience store here, uh, our recommendation is that uh, the relevancy is, uh, is not uh, as high as a specialized store. Um, one other important channel to consider is hotels and restaurants, especially high-end restaurants. Um, this can also be considered as uh, very relevant, uh, especially when it comes to beverages or alcoholic beverages products. Um, then through uh, e-commerce, uh, e-commerce platforms um, to use ideally in combination, of course, with other channels. Um, like uh, I've mentioned uh, in the beginning of my presentation, um, having your products uh, being sold via e-commerce does not exclude you from um, being uh, from placing your products uh, on, on on the shelf of all the other four channels above mentioned. Uh, and this, of course, uh, is also considered uh, very high, uh, highly relevant. Um, eventually, there is also one other channel. Uh, Let's call it gift channel, uh, but this requires normally nice packaging, um, and it has everything to do with uh, also the Chinese uh, tradition of exchanging goods um, at certain occasions or when uh, visiting uh, for uh, family uh, meals, and is relevant for some categories. Again, uh, for example, for wine, olive oil, uh, for chocolates. Um, but this can also be considered as one of the uh, channels to have your product sold um, in China to Chinese customers. So yeah, we highlighted uh, here uh, three uh, main channels you might want to pay more attention uh, to. Um, the main actors, so when it comes to um, importers, uh, here I'm going to introduce um, a bit more in details on which type of importers uh, you might be engaging with when uh, exporting to China. First of all, there is uh, uh, um, uh, some very well-known, very well-established uh, importers of 
um, foreign or even uh, European food and beverage uh, products um, who are dealing uh, with these products at a national level. So these are normally large companies and um, what they are after normally is also exclusivity. Uh, they might ask you to, uh, they might ask to become the only distributor of your products uh, within the country or within uh, a large part of the country. Um, sometimes these uh, importers can also be a, a, a foreign owned setup. Um, and this we're uh, normally talking about um, companies who are, who has a very well-established and large network of distribution. So uh, represents also very large sales forces. Um, and um, they normally have access to multiple channels. Um, however, um, having said all the nice things about uh, working with these uh, well-established, uh, famous, uh, well-known distributors, importers, is that they might be difficult to reach, uh, especially you are um, a family-owned business or you have very specific uh, products that you want to uh, convince the importer. Um, this might not be easy. Um, there are also uh, distributors or import tennis importers um, that has a specific focus on either certain products or on certain regions. Um, so, um, and um, yeah. Um, there might be a lot of these. That is the main challenge. Um, some Distributors can be uh, very experienced in dealing with, uh, for example, confectionery products or uh, sweets, uh, chocolates, um, and some can um, be very uh, efficient uh, in distributing in uh, one region of the country, for example, in Guangdong, um, um, where connectivity uh, is being uh, promoted. Um, where uh, normally also a lot of uh, warehouses are built. The challenge is that there are a good number of these type of uh, distributors, um, and they might also be very uh, optimist, uh, up to optimistic uh, traders. So the recommendation here we have for uh, for you for exporters uh, uh, is that you need to carefully do your uh, due diligence work uh, before you eventually pick. Uh, the distributor you would like to work with, um, or uh, again uh, through self imports that means to set up your own uh, UFI, set up your own wholly foreign owned uh, inter inter entity in China, uh, establish your own logistics company, uh, and eventually uh, sell your own products uh, through these channels. Um, and last but not the least is uh, through uh, cross-border e-commerce um, as being introduced. This is a low cost way um, to test um, if your markets uh, can be, a f if your product can be a favorable product by consumers uh, in the China markets uh, and cross-border e-commerce normally are also recommended uh, mostly as an entry level strategy before uh, you seriously step into uh, traditional sales uh, and start to uh, export uh, a large uh, value and volume of your products. Um, very quickly also on uh, the profile of Chinese consumers. Um, um, again, with any of these uh, single topic, we could expand it to a one hour, two hour um, discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm here only listing some of the, the main characteristics of uh, Chinese uh, consumers uh, nowadays, especially, um, who might be your primary targets uh, for your products. Um, first of all, they normally have limited knowledge uh, about new products, but at the same time, a big appetite for them. So they are open to um, um, trying uh, new stuff, to trying uh, different uh, types of uh, food and beverage products coming from different countries of origins. Uh, and uh, for especially 
um, the Chinese uh, middle and upper class uh, nowadays, cost is less of a concern, but the value for money or image are the key metrics when they are considering their consumption. Um, and also health awareness has, has started uh, and will grow in the importance along with uh, Chinese middle class. Um, the basket size for each purchase uh, has been reduced, um, but the purchasing frequency has been increased, uh, meaning that um, something for uh, them to consider is nowadays convenience when making their purchase. Um, once you are in the market, again, um, the game starts. Um, with this slide, I'm going to also quickly present to you um, which resources uh, can be made uh, available. Uh, of course, uh, a lot has been presented uh, about the EU SME Center. Uh, we're not going uh, too much uh, repeating ourselves here. Um, later, we'll also have uh, our uh, speaker uh, from the China IP SME Help Desk, who would provide you with uh, knowledge and information on uh, register uh, your trademark uh, before exporting, uh, tips on uh, preparation for participation to trade fairs, uh, and how to protect your uh, intellectual property rights. Um, and once once you are in China, you will also receive uh, support uh, from organizations like uh, like IHA, like ICCF, but also those being in China, uh, being the national uh, trade promotion agencies, the embassies, chamber of commerce. Um, one important thing to uh, mention, especially when it comes to the food and beverage uh, sector, is that uh, the EU is also um, launching uh, globally uh, many promotional campaigns, especially in non-EU markets, uh, uh, some of uh, which are specifically on food and beverage uh, products, which are uh, eventually resources as a food and beverage uh, uh, producer, uh, you might want to consider. Um, again, uh, a very complex market in China, uh, especially for new products, uh, requires a lot of uh, investments, uh, both uh, in time uh, and also in uh, in budgets uh, on markets, market of your pro uh, marketing of your products, on uh, education, on identifying first of all your target consumers and educate uh, the consumers um, on their consumption behaviors, on how they perceive uh, your products eventually before. Um, you can really boost your sales. So uh, very quickly, these are the resources uh, um, available uh, for everybody to uh, consider. Um, once you're in the market, the game starts. Uh, what are the significant resources for marketing and education? Um, again, in a nutshell, uh, IP registration, when it comes to IP uh, registration in China, important to consider even uh, before you enter the markets um, and social media presence is uh, also extremely and growing still growing uh, important um, when it comes to live streaming sessions uh, working with key opinion leaders in China but also key opinion customers um, to also launch uh, online offline promotional campaigns uh, for your products um, and uh, research and study also at, uh, about uh, China's online shopping uh, festivals, campaigns, uh, the very famous Double Eleven, Double Twelve, uh, uh, Six, Six, Eighteen, uh, you name it. There are a number of them uh, in China organized uh, normally by uh, the biggest uh, e-commerce platforms, uh, how to seize opportunity, how to invest smartly, uh, or in participation to these um, uh, occasions. Um, education and training, again, training of your importers, uh, organizing tastings of your products, uh, some video tutorials. Um, um, a look at also customer service and after sale service to uh, engage uh, better with your importers, but also eventually the consumers um, and about networking. So. 
uh, networking opportunities that includes uh, sponsorships to make your products more available, uh, participating to technical uh, seminars, and, and eventually once you're in China, um, there are also uh, many uh, specific focus uh, on for the beverage sectors, many of these trade fairs you might want to consider uh, to further engage um, at. To conclude, I think I am on time. Um, to conclude, <clears throat> um, in China, the market is um, still on the grow, but uh, it's uh, complex. At the same time, uh, making your products available on the market will not automatically generate uh, sales. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done afterwards, and there is no one single uh, Chinese uh, consumer. Um, find, uh, identify your targeted, uh, targeted consumers, uh, position yourself uh, well before you go. And there is also no one size fits uh, all uh, solution. So uh, do your homework, research your markets, your products, um, identify also uh, the region where most of your targeted consumers are based. Uh, before you um, plan to uh, enter the market, uh, get prepared. I think this is the end of my presentation. Um, and um, I believe we have question and answer uh, in the end. So I will uh, stop here and pass the floor to uh, our second speaker for today. Yes, just, just um, a question that arrived uh, in the chat from uh, yeah. Michele. <clears throat> Uh, that ask you, William, uh, when you mentioned hotels and restaurants, do you refer to single units or large and small chains of hotels and restaurants? Um, so this, um, I can go a bit further on this. This, um, the general term for this is um, we call, we call it food services. Uh, again, um, it also has everything to do with the fact that, especially for uh, alcoholic beverage products uh, or water, uh, sparkling water, bottled water, um, um, that has also everything to do with uh, Chinese uh, dining um, um, habits that uh, um, a lot of these uh, high-end liquors, wines are consumed um, at the meals. This also goes for, for example, uh, craft, imported craft beers, uh, but uh, some uh, represent large units, some represent large price margin. Um, it's really up to eventually how you target, how you position yourself on the market. Uh, uh, do you still see large uh, margin of your products once they are being uh, made available in the markets? Uh, and if you are targeting high-end uh, boutique uh, hotels, or you are uh, targeting um, a middle class but uh, chain Chinese restaurants uh, where you, you want to have uh, your uh, products, uh, your uh, food products uh, being sold there. Um, again, I don't think uh, we have too much time to go uh, back and forth discussion, but uh, I would invite uh, you to also maybe reach out to us after today's session so we can engage on an uh, individual basis uh, to uh, give you more uh, details. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay, Arvid, please take okay. the floor. Um, thank you very much, Liam, for the introduction and um, thanks to Aisha for having us today. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Um, I'm going to give you some technical um, requirements. I'm going to tell you about the technical requirements um, you're going to face. Will you for the process for exporting the product to China? Also some label labeling or certification requirements. Um, my name is Avi Tilner. I'm also working for the USME Center, I'm trying to bring some transparency to the regulatory framework by providing reports or guidelines, um, and you can always contact us using the Ask the Expert function, function which I highlighted here on the bottom of my slide. Um, I, what I'm going to talk about is I just put bring us all on the same line, but I'm like, where to enter the market? I know Liam mentioned it already. I'm just I'm going to show you where we stand for the labeling requirements and the technical requirements I'm going to talk about. And Arvid, sorry, we don't see yes. your full screen. 
Both agree. Oh, uh, yes. Um... Okay. Um... Does it work now? Nope. Does it work now? Yes. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. So um, after that, I'm going to show you a few two examples on how to enter the Chinese market. Um, one on for the exporter side. One uh, is the manufacturer side, and then I'm ending my presentation by giving you some labeling requirements. And actually, I'm ending my um, presentation by um, introducing you to some, one of our service we're currently conducting, but we'll talk about this later. So as um, Liam already mentioned, there are two main pathways to enter the Chinese market. Um, there's cross-border e-commerce that is getting more popular in the last years and um, involves basically a shortcut for USMEs to enter the Chinese market. And you can benefit from several several advantages, such as fast custom clearance, um, the absence of establishing a company in China, and yeah, less formal requirements in general. Um, on the other hand, there's general trade, and um, that is what I'm actually going to um, focus in my presentation today. As um, there's more requirements you have to face um, to bring your product to China. Uh, general trade is a common way of importing products to China, and it, as uh, Liam already mentioned, it includes a lengthy registration and certification process. Uh, but the main advantage of general trade is that once you've successfully approved or, or the products are approved, um, you can import them without any limitations on quantity and stored basically in any warehouse in China. And you can use both physical stores and traditional e-commerce platforms. Um, so let's talk about how to actually bring your food and beverage products to China. Um, China's food safety governance has been significantly increased and strengthened in the past years. Um, the overarching government uh, framework uh, is uh, generally represented by the food safety law um, and uh, the more detailed implementation regulations. Um, basically, these two documents set out the comprehensive and clear requirements for the production, the import, um, the sale, but also the recall and uh, traceability of food products in China. Um, the country's food and beverage safety is supervised by multiple government agencies um, and departments, but mainly by the State Administration for Market Regulation, SAMR, the National Health, Health Commission, um, NHC, and Chinese Customs, um, which is referred, often referred to as GACC. And uh, depending on the food and beverage products, um, certain registrations or notifications are necessary to obtain customs clearance and are general, and, yeah, that are generally eligible to export your products to China. So therefore, I will give you a general overview of the two most common uh, registrations for food and beverage products, um, which is the exporter registration and the manufacturing or storing facility registration. But please keep in mind that there may be some other requirements um, for certain products. Just to give you an example, um, health food like vitamins, for example, you, before you do the manufacturing um, registration, you actually have to do another pre-filing with uh, SAMR in order to be eligible to bring the products to China or actually already or just getting the customs um, certificate. Um, so let's start with the first process. Um, if one company is only um, responsible for the export of goods, but does not manufacture or process uh, the goods, then you basically should do a filing as an overseas exporting company on GICC's um, platform. I um, inserted here a, a, an, an image of, a, of the registration process because it's usually in Chinese, or it's all in Chinese, and um, 
not everyone may be familiar with the Chinese language, so here's a little pathway on how to um, how to navigate through the customs page. Um, but generally, you just have to find the term exporter or agent filing of imported food and cosmetics. Um, if, on the other hand, if you actually want to cooperate with the Chinese distributor, that's also fine. Um, the EUSME Center is actually, um, or we, we can help you do a credibility check of these companies. Um, if you, for example, want to check the liquidity, if they have enough liquidity, liquidity on their accounts, or um, even if they have been fined in the last years, um, we can check that and um, hope to minimize the um, risk of fraud. Um, so the um, world process is more difficult if you're actually producing or processing food and beverage products. Um, so we're talking now about Decree 248, um, many, maybe many already heard of you. Um, so with the implementation of Decree 248 in 2022, heightened requirements um, resulted for overseas food and beverage manufacturers, producers, and storing facilities. So all overseas uh, establishments, uh, um, manufacturing, producing, processing, and storing food and beverage products um, that are going to export it to China must um, register on a dedicated um, system, the so-called cipher system, or often referred to as a single window, um, before the products are actually um, arrived to the Chinese market. Um, so as I said, this is required for any product like any food and beverage product. And this is a big change to previous regulations um, like before 2021, uh, before 2022, excuse me. Um, because in, in 2022 um, or before, 2020, before the change actually occurred, only four products, product categories had to do the registration, mainly meat, dairy, aquatic products, and bird nest products. But now um, actually, um, there are two main product categories, um, the so-called high-risk and low-risk products. Um, so for the case, well, sometimes there's the case that um, there are several companies involved in the production of or in the manufacturing process to um, to bring the to yeah to finish the goods, and um, even over a year late in the process or after establishment of this procedure, there's no clear regulation on that. For example, um, often it's the case, the, the company that um, conducts the majority of the manufacturing process has to do the registration. But there has been cases where the company that actually finished the good uh, needed to do the registration. So, you know, I, what I want to say with that is actually that you need to um, yeah, yeah. Calculate a lot of time um, into these processes because they're taking quite a long time. Um, so as I said, there are for now two high risk, uh, two product categories: the high risk and the low risk products. Um, so for the high risk products, there are nineteen categories, um, which basically have to do a full registration procedure. That means um, before actually starting the registration, you need to do or to get in contact with your competent authority um, in your country or region where the establishment is based. Uh, I showed you, uh, I listed all these 19 high risk products here that contains products that are naturally having higher risk, such as meat. Um, a credit products, but egg, also eggs or um, fruits and veggies are also now considered high risk. Um, so all other products that are not listed here are by default low risk products, and they can actually do the registration process themselves by self registration. Um, so let's talk about how actually to do this registration process. Um, so as it discussed, the first step is to identify the risk level. So is it is your product a high risk or a low risk product? If your product is considered a high risk product, uh, the, the application process starts with identifying and contacting the competent authority that is overseeing the food product export um, in their country or region. 
Then the competent authority is doing a, pre a preliminary review of, um, of your, your overseas establishment and um, the products you're going to export. And um, also collects those application materials such as um, um, letter of recommendation or business licenses. And um, yeah, all this collected information will be submitted by the competent authority to Chinese customs, GICC. And um, actually, if you're not sure which uh, competent authority is the, um, the relevant or the right one for you, you can easily contact us and we're, um, we're having a list of most EU member states um, competent authorities. We also included them to one of our report posts that I listed at the end of our of my presentation. Um, so sometimes uh, Chinese customs also ask for additional documentation, such as um, what are the food safety um, standards um, or sanitation requirements um, you, you, you conduct in, um, what protecting, uh, protection systems uh, have you established, or um, maybe information like a factory floor, floor plan is also requested. Um, you see there are quite a lot of information they're asking for, and um, that's why we also invited someone from the IP help desk today, because you should always protect your intellectual property and all the information you're providing um, and making sure that these are protected. But we will hear more about this in, a, in the next presentation. So this is this is the process basically for high risk products. Um, on the other hand, if you're low risk products, um, you can skip this step and you don't have to contact the competent authority and um, you can do or create your account on the Cypher system yourself. Um, and once you submitted the application, GSC re um, review, reviews um, these information and provides um, some login information. Um, for the competent authority, uh, sorry, for high risk products, um, the competent authority will receive these information and um, will then submit them to the company. And then it actually follows or it follows a detailed um, registration process where you have to provide more information about the company, such as name, address, um, contact person, um, but you also have to provide more information on the product uh, themselves, um, such as HS codes, um, which ingredients you're using, which raw materials have you used, um, also maybe which supplier um, are you engaging with. So, this is a process that can take a lot of time because you need to gather quite a lot of information. Um, once all of these information are complete, um, the applicant can submit the registration to GSCC and um, they will review the application. It might happen that, um, especially for high risk products, that um, GSCC wants to do an on site inspection of the manufacturing facility, for example. And wants to see if all these information you provided are true and, and wants to check them themselves. So this is also a process that's um, during, actually during COVID it was done online because they couldn't travel abroad, but now it's coming back and people want to visit the manufacturing facilities. Um, and this can of course also delay the whole process. Um, so once you actually got the approval, which is the best case, um, you're receiving a registration code, which you have to add to your um, label, uh, which I'm going to show you in the next slides. And um, at this stage, you can um, export the products to China. Um, so as I said, if you want to have more information on this process, we have a full dedicated report on how to fill in the information. Um, I linked it at the end of my presentation. So let's talk about labeling. Um, there are several standards involved uh, in regulating the labeling requirements on food and beverage products. Um, you can see here four of the most common and general standards for food and beverage products. Um, not only those are to consider, but there are also some additional requirements for certain product categories um, that must be followed. Just to give, or to coming back to my example on health uh, supplements, such as vitamins, um, you have to 
actually you have a lot of regulations on um, that are limiting the language um, you can basically use. You, for example, you can't use certain claims or you can't um, say that the first have healing um, um, healing functions, for example. Another example maybe for the wine industry or the general alcoholic beverages. Obviously, you need to provide the content level of alcohol in percentage, but that's also a requirement. But also, you need to add a warning, um, such as um, I think excessive drinking is harmful for health. So, and of course, in Chinese. Um, and in my opinion, um, not finding the right standards and um, doing mistakes or creating faulty labels is usually the main or key factor for not getting customs clearance. Um, so it's also generally generally required that the content of the label must be legal, true, um, complete, accurate, um, but also consistent with the, the information you have provided during the registration process. Um, I also listed here information that um, needs to be attached attached to the label. Um, please take in mind there might be some more requirements depending on your products, but um, this could maybe contain information such as um, or specifications such as um, table of ingredients, um, the net content, a producer's name and contact details, um, name of the importer or distributor, um, the table of ingredients and nutrition nutritional facts. Actually, this has a whole standard for themselves um, how to do the design on the nutrition um, nutritional facts. Of course, you need to um, apply uh, and provide information on the production date and expiry date, and there's some um, more information depending on the product. Also, as mentioned, um, uh, with the implementation of Decree 248 and 2022, the registration code also needs to be submitted as part of the label. Um, I brought you here a little image of, of one of, um, it's actually a Spanish product that uh, uh, I think it's, it's a muesli bar and um, they basically attached a sticker to, to the original label and this is a total fine um, method to do, but you have to provide all this information in Chinese as highlighted here and the red highlighted part is the registration code you get from, um, from GICC. Um, but uh, please take a mind them not, you can't use a sticker for every product. For example, for meat product, for um, aquatic products, for health products, you need to usually create their own dedicated label as part of the uh, whole package. So you can't use a sticker as here uh, illustrated. Um, so all labeling and marking must be um, registered and approved uh, by Chinese authorities um, before the products are actually shipped to China. Um, so that means that you actually have to provide a Chinese and usually an English label. Um, during the registration process, and um, but you of course only need the Chinese label to attach to the products. Further, or lastly, um, actually, there are very detailed rules on in terms of language, uh, in terms of information you have to provide, and how you design actually the whole label. Um, for instance, all the information on the label must be of course in Chinese, because the target audience are Chinese customers. Um, with the exception of the name and address of the manufacturer, these usually can be um, written in Latin words. Um, but for example, the size of the Latin, uh, of the letters have to be the same size as the Chinese characters, or they must be smaller. So there are plenty of regulations you have to follow. Um, so please keep that in mind. So. We're at the end of my presentation. I just want to um, mention a survey we're currently conducting. Um, it's about the decree 248 I mentioned before um, for all manufacturing, producing, and storing facilities. Um, if you already have used or um, 
if you have on oh, let me if you're already registered with these um platforms we're happy to hear your feedback if you're currently in the process of doing so and you're facing some problems we're also very happy to hear about this because um, we would summarize the information and help to um cooperate with jfc to find solutions to um yeah make the process smoother and easier um we have some webinars upcoming um, actually one was yesterday but we will upload the webinar on our website it was about the dairy sector if you're interested in that um there are also some upcoming reports on the health food market and the dairy food uh, product market um which will be released um, in the next month so keep an eye on that i um listed all the materials here you can access easily and thanks for your attention i think we can Give the floor now to the next speaker, to Titulio. Eddie Tulio, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, good morning to all participants. Uh, since I'm the last speaker, uh, can you confirm me that I still have a half an hour for my presentation? Okay, thank you very much. So I will share my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes, it works. Okay, great. So um, uh, today we will uh, speak a little bit about the uh, protection of intellectual property in China. It was mentioned this topic several times uh, in the previous presentations. So we start uh, uh, very fast. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, my name is Elio De Tullio. I'm an Italian lawyer and uh, a trademark attorney. And, uh, I am the, the founder and managing partner of the Tullian Partners. We are um, an, a team of uh, uh, lawyers uh, and IP attorneys supporting SMEs uh, to export products and services in China and other countries. Uh, I will not uh, um, uh, take too much time to uh, focus on the FMB uh, industry in China, since it was covered by previous presentation. I will go to the protection of intellectual property in China. So uh, first of all, only uh, uh, registered intellectual property rights are protected in China because, uh, for instance, uh, de facto trademarks uh, or uh, IP rights only in use in China can be hardly protected. Uh, you have to um, uh, collect and, and, uh, um, and uh, present before the court uh, in case of uh, uh, a legal dispute uh, an amount of evidence that uh, make it very, very difficult. Uh, so China adopts the first to file system for IPR, meaning that uh, only those uh, who file uh, the uh, IP right, uh, the IP right application first, uh, are also the owner holder of the uh, intellectual property. Um, what is the best way to proceed? What is the best practice? You need first of all to identify uh, EU agent because the EU agent will uh, take care of uh, uh, the, the the strategy, the worldwide strategy of protection of your IPRs. And also we we'll take care of, uh, you know, the connection with the Chinese lawyer. There are some gaps in terms of languages, in terms of culture. So it's a very, uh, it's very common that uh, you have uh, an EU agent that will liaise with the Chinese agent, the Chinese attorney for uh, filing prosecution and uh, um, also litigation before courts. Of course, if you use the international systems, we will uh, then focus on international system like uh, the Madrid system for trademark or the PCT for patents, you can also uh, um, start the protection directly from the country of origin. Um, uh, it is also important to protect the Chinese transliteration of trademarks. We will see then uh, several cases in which uh, um, some EU companies under-evaluated this aspect and then had some problems with the, you know, the, um, with the several uh, um, cost of protection, additional cost of protection and uh, uh, in order to uh, secure their products and services. Uh, Trade of protection lasts 10 years renewable for um, an indefinite period of time. Patent protection lasts for 20 years uh, from the date of filing and utility models that are small patents, petty patents like, uh, you know, uh, covering uh, um, uh, very, um, let's say, not highly technical inventions uh, last 
for 10 years. Uh, of course, you need to pay maintenance fees, so-called annuities. These rules are not enforced for Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. Uh, what are the registration authorities? The registration authorities are, um, you know, are centralized at CNIPA. The CNIPA is the China National Intellectual Property Administration the, um, due to uh, a recent reform that centralized this uh, competence uh, at this uh, authority. But then for copyright, uh, you can register copyright at the Copyright Protection Center of China that is authorized by the National Copyright Administration of China. Um, China is very active um, in terms of uh, um, addition to the main uh, intellectual property conventions. The most important is the Paris Convention uh, of 1883 uh, dealing with the uh, priority rights. So the owner of an application for registration of an IP right filing one of the member states of the Paris Convention. So if you file an application in Italy or in Spain or uh, in UK, may use a priority period of six months for the science and trademarks or one year for uh, patents and utility models uh, uh, from the filing of the application in the country of origin to extend the protection of the first filing in China through the national filing in that country or also with the uh, international filing as we'll see afterwards. Um, so you can always can claim protection from the date of the first filing in the country of origin. Um, China is also a member of the Madrid System for Trademark and the Patent Cooperation Treaty for Patents, so you can start the protection of your rights in the country of origin, so in Italy, Spain, or in UK. Um, the object of protection uh, for China is in line with international standard, but what is very important for you is to check the, uh, let's say, inherent registrability and the novelty of your rights before starting any filing registration process. So you need to uh, ask your IP attorney to carry out the search uh, and then to provide you for a legal opinion about, uh, you know, the possibility to validly use and uh, um, validly register your rights uh, in China using the international or the national path. Um, let's focus on trademarks now. Um, once again, uh, trademarks are a, a commercial source identifier. Uh, they are very important for uh, the FMB sector, um, and uh, um, you can opt for the once again from the international route. So, filing an application uh, in uh, um, through WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and claiming one of the what 125 countries of the Madrid system. Uh, or you can opt for the national uh, path. So you can file an application before the CNIPA, before the China National Intellectual Property Administration. Um, there are some reforms uh, in China. Um, let's say, uh, starting from 2014, several reforms uh, try to make it simple, make it faster, and of course, uh, um, uh, avoid the problems uh, related to bad faith application filed by Chinese entities. Um, so right now there are specific time limits for many procedures that currently require no less than two or three years. Uh, so uh, and then the uh, CNIPA open it to the registration of non-conventional trademark. So for instance, you can register it in China, uh, 3D trademarks or uh, um, or uh, um, um, holograms trademarks uh, or other sound trademarks. Uh, so very uh, let's say unconventional trademarks. Um, in case uh, you have a prior use of your trademark in China without registration, once again, it's not easy to collect evidences and documents because China is a very wide territory. So you we will have some troubles. Above all, if you like to license your trademark to third parties, to a licensee, and that is very common in the FMB sector. Um, um, take care of the classification. In case you are um, working uh, with an IP attorney, he will, or she will take care uh, about the uh, uh, correct classification for your products and services in China. Indeed, China is a uh, part of the NICE convention. So uh, uh, it is part of the main convention for classification system uh, in the trademark uh, sector, but uh, um, CNIPA adopts uh, a sub-classification that is uh, you know, peculiar of China. So it's very common that after the filing through the international path or through the national path, you can receive an office section saying, this product is not correctly classified according to the Chinese practice. So take care of this. Um, as to patents, uh, China is part of the Patent Cooperation Treaty with more than 155 members uh, through, uh, throughout the world. 
um, and uh, you, you can use for patents uh, also priority right. We already mentioned this. Uh, so you have 12 uh, months priority in case of the, the filing of your first uh, application in your country of origin. Um, so company owning patents and doing business in China, uh, they want to create very long-term value uh, and also finding investors or licensees or potential partners in technological sector in China need to protect patents. Um, and uh, uh, they need to protect patents not only in the country of origin, but also in the country of destination. You have several kinds of patents, invention patents, utility model patents, design patents. Um, let's focus on the first two, uh, saying that the legal requirements are novelty, so the, the, the invention must be new uh, uh, compared to uh, what has been patented or disclosed to the public overseas or in China uh, before the filing. And uh, um, in case of utility model, they are, you know, uh, um, smaller patents, uh, let's say, with a lower level of in inventive step. And the inventive step is the, the complexity of the technical solution uh, aiming at solving the technical problems uh, object of the patent. Uh, the design patent uh, patents protect uh, only the aesthetical part of the uh, of the product, so the color, the the shape, the the decoration. Uh, provided that they are new and they have individual character, uh, they last uh, uh, fifteen years uh, due to recent reform of the sector. Um, um, China is not a member of the Hague Convention but, uh, about the, uh, the international design registration. So in case you would like to use uh, um, to protect your design in China, you need to use the national path. Uh, as to copyright, so copyright is the protection of uh, uh, any kind of literary and artistic work, but also uh, include images of each product. Uh, sometimes it, it includes logo of uh, um, that can also be protected through uh, trademarks, brochures, catalogs, website contents, labels, uh, various marketing material, but also the look and feel, for instance, of your um, of your uh, um, website. Uh, China is a member of the Ban Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Work. Uh, don't forget that copyright is a right that arises automatically at the time of creation of the work, let's say theoretically, independently of, from any kind of filing registration process, but uh, for the reversal of the burden of proof, it's better to uh, file an application before the uh, competent copyright office. Um, if the work has been published in a foreign country, it enjoys automatic protection. If it is also published in China, or if the author is a national of a country, that is party to the international agreement in this field, like the Berne Convention. Uh, but once again, it's better that you protect, you file an, an application before the Copyright Protection Center of China. Uh, even the, um, indeed, the, this voluntary registration provides a clear proof of ownership of the right in case uh, it is used before a court. I will not uh, um, um, spend too much time about formalities you need to um, match uh, in order to. Uh, um, uh, file an application and register your copyright in China, uh, it is important to remember that uh, um, the duration of the protection of patrimonial life rights, let's say economic rights, uh, is equal to the author's life plus 50 years after his death, while the protection of moral rights, so rights um, to be recognized as the author of the work and also uh, the, the starting date of this protection is unlimited. Um, so uh, here you can find in the slide all formalities and all uh, uh, other um, uh, peculiarities about uh, uh, the series of documents uh, you need to uh, fill in in order to uh, file an application before the uh, CPCC. Um, you can protect uh, uh, through the corporate system also software. Um, in case you, you decide to protect software through the corporate system, you need to um, uh, provide for uh, the details of the software program, including the data of its establishment, the operating environment, including all details of uh, hardware requirements and operating system, the programming language used, and the substance of the software. Um, and so uh, um, in this case, uh, you will uh, receive this kind of protection. Remember that uh, uh, the copyright protection uh, does not imply uh, any substantial examination process 
So let's say that compared to the other protection of IP is a little bit weaker. So in case you like to, um, to have a stronger protection, you, you can always uh, carry out first a patent search and understand if and what extent your software can be protected through uh, the patent system in China. This is very rare, uh, so it's uh, an exception, but you can still uh, um, think that uh, according to some circumstances, if it can, it can be considered a computer implemented invention, uh, so it can be protected uh, in China through the patent system. Geographical indications. GIs are connected with a know-how developed in some uh, region, in some territories, uh, from uh, uh, which uh, products uh, can um, have the names, the denomination, are fundamental for products that, that have a certain quality, reputation, or other characteristics influenced by the environmental or cultural conditions of the regions where they are produced. There are two ways to protect European GIs in China. One is a certification marker, collective mark uh, in China uh, before the CNIPA, and the other is uh, as a product quality and characteristics marking uh, as a sui generis system, uh, a system that is uh, quite similar to the European one uh, with the CNIPA. Um, uh, the other way is uh, to be included in this list um, uh, 100 plus 100 of European GIs that according to the EU-China agreement on geographical indication, it was concluded in 2019 and uh, provided protection from some, let's say, well-known European GIs uh, in China. Uh, but in any case, uh, it is uh, advisable to consider if you are not a well-known GI in China, you are, you are not included in this list, to consider the protection as collective or certification program. Also new, plant variety can be protected in China, provided that uh, um, they possess novelty, distinct, distinctness, uniformity, and stability, and of course, an adequate denomination, because in China, China um, joined the uh, Convention of the International Union for the Protection of New Plant Varieties in 1999. So according to some condition uh, and some legal requirements, uh, uh, an application can be filed before the Ministry of, of Agriculture. There is a special director, directorate uh, before the m and uh, uh, if you submit your application in Chinese, you can get a territorial right in China. Also trade secrets, so confidential information can be protected in China. Um, uh, what are the legal requirements? Of course, uh, this information must be uh, secret, so not publicly available. They must have an economic value, and the uh, owner should have adopted, adopted the um, um, necessary uh, legal, technical, and um, uh, technological and physical measures to uh, maintain this secrecy. Um, so in the FMB sector, there are several aspects of the procedures uh, or also of the manufacturing techniques or the uh, taste or testing methods that can be protected through the, the trade secret. But uh, remember that the trade secret protection is not submitted to any uh, filing registrations process. So you can understand that if you um, develop it at your, uh, in your organization, um, uh, um, a good, uh, let's say, uh, good procedures and good protocols in order to make them um, protectable uh, only when you go before a court and you try to enforce your rights. In any case, it's a good practice to uh, include in all uh, contracts with providers, with clients, uh, with uh, uh, partners, uh, uh, but also with employees, uh, um, uh, specific clauses protecting trade secrets or know-how, uh, mapping all the documents with confidential. Um, what what uh, we have been spoken about uh, is very important in order to have uh, uh, an effective protection during trade fairs. So if you um, would like to export your products in China, you uh, probably are considering to attend a trade fair. Uh, consider that if you did all well, so you filed your application, you obtained your registration in China, the protection during trade fairs is, is very effective. Um, uh, for trade fairs uh, uh, lasting more than two days, uh, it is uh, uh, compulsory to um, establish an IPR bureau that can uh, take immediate decision of, uh, you know, uh, uh, seizure or even blocking some products, infringing products uh, during the trade fair. 
So it is very important that you file an application and obtain the registration before going to the trade fair in China, because in case you, you have all the documents uh, um, properly uh, maintained and you have uh, everything in order, you can, um, uh, you can uh, both uh, start a, a legal proceeding before a court or you know, fa file an application before this IPR bureau. Um, you, are, you will be requested to provide uh, all relevant documents uh, from the registration certificate to the proof of uh, uh, the infringement and other documents, but you can challenge a bad faith registration or bad faith um, commerce of products that are similar to yours. Um, also, licensing is based on IPRs. Uh, so licensing is, is the main um, contract uh, uh, according to which uh, um, um, products and services can be sold on, in China. Uh, of course, even in this case, uh, the, um, the, 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 the whereas is that you have protected your right in China. You have proper uh, registration in your hands. And in this case, you can enter into a licensing agreement, uh, also um, proposing uh, the licensee uh, specific IP clauses. You will be requested to provide the declaration of warranties, but then you can submit uh, uh, the licensee to uh, a, a strict uh, control of what he is doing in, uh, in China. And now some case studies. Um, the first two case studies are related to um, um, uh, two very quite famous uh, uh, companies, Hennessy and uh, uh, Ferrero. Uh, I, I'm displaying them because uh, um, in order to make you uh, uh, aware that uh, even if, uh, let's say, the, um, the protection of intellectual property in China is not easy, uh, once you have uh, done your things very well, you have invested money in protection, um, you have carried out all searches, uh, you have very strong rights in your hand, then you can also get uh, compensation of damages. In the first case, the NSC only managed to obtain uh, 50,000 uh, RMB, that, there, that is a very small amount of money, but in the second case, Ferrero in 2015, managed to obtain uh, something like uh, 250,000 uh, euros, uh, uh, so 2,000 million RMB, uh, for the uh, infringing of the 3D trademark of chocolate packaging. Um, the third case is related to Golden Olive Limited, a company that registered its trademark uh, uh, in uh, uh, Latin and Chinese character. It started negotiations with distributors in China, and the negotiations were based actually uh, on the uh, protection of IP rights. So, and uh, in this uh, way, uh, this company managed to, um, to, uh, to start a business in China. Um, of course, uh, it had to adapt uh, the strategy of protection in China uh, to the Chinese rules. For instance, uh, it did not manage to protect uh, the patent design in China because uh, it was already registered in Europe five years earlier. So, it was a lucky novelty. Uh, but then it adopted some. Um, alternative uh, um, strategies like the protection of the packaging uh, through copyright, uh, performing a voluntary copyright registration. Uh, this is a case about plant variety. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, a Chinese uh, citizen uh, filed an application for this soup in class 31, indicating the goods of grains, fresh vegetable, vegetables, and food stuff for animals, not knowing that these are already a, a plant variety, right? So in this case, um, um, the, the, the competent authority, the TRAB, the Trademark Reexamination Education Board, said that Mr. Son should have been aware of the existence of this prior right, uh, so the Trademark SUPI cannot function in terms of identifying the source of the goods. So in this case, the TRAB revoked uh, Mr. Son's trademark registration for all the products uh, uh, strictly connected with the new plant variety right and uh, but maintained it for the other goods. Uh, then a couple of cases about geographic indication. Uh, the first one is related to a GI uh, registered in China, um, registered in China in Latin character. Um, in this case, uh, 
the uh, GI organization filed the registration with the China Trademark Office to protect the GI as collective trademark in order to avoid any kind of risk. Um, because as mentioned before, the sui generis system is only, let's say, available for uh, Chinese entities or for those uh, um, GIs um, uh, that are part of the uh, EU-China agreement. But uh, in the second case, uh, the, uh, the a Chinese company filed uh, um, a GI uh, called Ao Fuji, uh, on good on goods such as butter in class 29. The application was approved and published, but then the INAO, the Institut National de l'Origine et de la Qualité, lodged an opposition against the mark by stating that this mark was identical to the Chinese name of the foreign GI Bud Auvergne uh, in, in Chinese uh, uh, language, uh, de uh, o so the, the last part is uh, identical. And uh, in this case, the CNIPA supported INAO's position and rejected the mark's registration. And uh, this means, once again, that it's important to consider that GIs uh, are not only protected through the sui generis system in China, but also through the collective and certification trademark system. It is always uh, very good to protect also the transliteration or the translation of the name in Chinese language, because sometimes uh, infringements can uh, go on that way. Um, another case is uh, about online protection of geographic indication. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, the e-commerce platform rejected the petition of uh, starting a um, uh, notice and take out process uh, for an infringing product, saying that uh, non-trademark geographic indication products are not accepted for filing as intellectual property qualification uh, and uh, inviting the owner to protect the GI through other means. Uh, this once again confirms that uh, it is better to consider also to protect the GI uh, through the trademark uh, collective or certification system uh, in China. Because in that case, uh, the platform should have uh, um, uh, accept the request, the petition for the take uh, notice and take down. And uh, another case is uh, um, the uh, trademark copyright protection. Uh, in this case, it is an Hungarian reserve wine maker that decided to enter Chinese market uh, to sell wines uh, through supermarket chain. He decided to register the trademark of the Madi system, but then. Uh, once the re registration were completed, the partner supermarket had been contacted. The uh, um, uh, he uh, and then he decided to go uh, for uh, promoting the products uh, through trade fairs. He discovered that there were bad faith sellers in most of the major e-commerce platform selling a counterfeit version of the SME's wine. These counterfeit products had a name in Chinese character that the winemaker was not able to recognize, but he did recognize the logo because the logo was uh, identical to the family crest embedded in it. So after consulting with uh, Chinese partners, uh, they were informed that the Chinese characters in the name of the product constitute a phonetic translation, the original name. And so this translation was made for the supermarkets for the use of uh, on the stores. Um, and at the end, the winemaker decided to start, uh, you know, uh, 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 an enforcement. So start to um, think to um, start, uh, Notice and take down procedures before an uh, uh, e-commerce platform, but at the end of the day, he realized that uh, he didn't have uh, registered uh, uh, the trademark in Chinese character, and uh, uh, he didn't have registered the copyright as well, while the counterparty um, uh, had done that. Uh, so at the end of the day, the bad faith seller had a voluntary copyright registration certificate for the winemaker's logo, and at the same time, the the uh, registration of the Chinese version of the trademark. So he had to spend a lot of money to uh, enforce uh, its rights um, because invalidation of a voluntary copyright certificate is uh, not easy in China. So you need to um, uh, to uh, to, cl to claim uh, to claim it before the People's Court and also the opposition uh, to a trademark registration is not easy. So let's say the cancellation of already registered uh, trademark. And finally, three cases about uh, patents. I will, not, I will only uh, display the first one. Uh, it's a typical case uh, um, regarding the infringement of patents. So um, uh, a company that uh, um, during a trade fair 
during the monitoring of uh, boots of competitors, become aware of a suspected infringement of its registered patent by another Chinese company. So uh, he made a complaint before the IPR Bureau. The IPR Bureau collected all the evidences uh, and uh, found that the infringement was uh, uh, correctly uh, uh, was correctly uh, um, found. And the following uh, uh, failed attempt to mediation between the parties, the IPR Bureau ordered the company, the counterparty, to stop the exposition of the machinery that infringed the company, uh, the, 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 the owner's patent. And uh, uh, so the, the, let's see, the infringement was, uh, was stopped during the trade fair. And after that, uh, the uh, owner of the rights also filed a civil lawsuit against the company, the counterparty, providing agencies collected at the trade fairs and obtaining also compensation of damages. So I will skip the other two cases on patents. They are more or less uh, you know, the same contents. And uh, uh, I will show you uh, what you can do in order to uh, receive uh, uh, fresh information about protection of uh, IPR in China. So you can uh, um, uh, send an email to uh, this email address or call the uh, call center of the, the helpline of uh, uh, the EU China IPR SME help desk. Uh, uh, the geographic coverage um, goes also on uh, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan. Uh, you can uh, find a lot of material on the website, um, uh, soft landing material. You can also request a one to one session. You can participate to several training workshop webinars, uh, and uh, uh, you will find a lot of very interesting materials and case studies. Well, the case studies mentioned during uh, this uh, um, uh, session were uh, taken by uh, the uh, SME, uh, IPR SME uh, publication. Uh, stay connected. These are our uh, social network uh, contacts uh, on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and uh, um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you, Ariel. If I may just very quickly take the floor, I understand that we are running um, a bit behind schedule, um, but happy that uh, we still have 46 participants uh, who stayed almost to the end with us. Um, during your presentation, Ariel, me and Arvid, I think we took uh, most of the questions. Uh, there was just now, I think, one outstanding uh, for for you uh, and also for us as well. Um, um, so, Elio, uh, thanks for the very clear presentation of IP. Just one quick question. As a lot of European products are uh, in, to China are GIs, is this a specific procedure for the GI companies, but it's been treated uh, through the center? Uh, yes, um, we have public, uh, published information on our website uh, as well. Uh, if yes, which one? Uh, thanks. We'll uh, try to send you more information if you contact us uh, at the uh, info at usmecenter.org.cn. Uh, and for uh, IP help desk, uh, um, Elio explains the procedure regarding tweet marks for uh, tweet fairs to the sender, but what for GIs? Thanks a lot. Well, um, I try to be um, clearer. So if uh, your GI, your European GI is not listed in the uh, EU uh, Chinese uh, uh, agreement on GIs, uh, uh, you need to consider different uh, uh, ways to protect your GIs in China. The best way is to consider to protect GIs not through the sui generis system, but through the collective and certification trademark system that allows you to uh, uh, obtain some privileges. Of course, uh, um, it's a, always a case, a case, um, a case by case approach. Uh, it depends on which GIs, when it was recognized, if it is already been used in China. And uh, of course, if you uh, would like uh, uh, to uh, go to China with your GI, a preliminary assessment is needed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Giorgio, if I may uh, suggest, um, I think we should, uh, it's about time we close today's session. Um, and um, before we do that, uh, the slides uh, will be shared with our participants afterwards. Um, Giorgio will uh, also, uh, my colleague Davide Orlandi will be uh, in touch with you uh, to send you the uh, slides, which contains the contact information
of uh, the USME Center, iChat, and also uh, the IPSME Help Desk. So uh, should you have any further questions, I recommend you to uh, be in touch with us so we can support you more better uh, on the individual cases. Thank you very much for your attention.